to. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Dalen over here and welcome to another session of working in UX design. And tonight we have a very special guest, uh, Jing Xiu Cheng, who is a UX designer for the Defense Science and Technology Agency at, uh, in Singapore. So uh, they're in charge of helping uh, back up our military and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Jing Xiu explain later what they do exactly. <laughs> Um, but Jing Xiu is someone who has been trained in the discipline of human computer interaction. So he actually has a master's degree in human computer interaction, um, as well as a bachelor's in psychology. So I'm here to uh, speak with him today about the value of UX internships and degrees, uh, knowing that he has actually done internships uh, when he was in London as well, uh, as well as he, he himself acquiring a degree and he, he himself finding a job uh, and recently lending a role as a UX designer here uh, locally. So um, it's my pleasure to welcome Jing Xiu Cheng. Um, and if you're new to this session, we do this monthly every, every month uh, where we invite a special guest uh, and it's our way of giving back to the community and also engaging on topics and discussion um, discussion topics that the community cares about. So, uh, Jing Xiu, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good today. Thank you for the very warm introduction. Uh, yeah, and thank you everyone for joining in and listening. I uh, hope I can like share some of my insights that hopefully will be valuable to all of you. Um, yeah, today I just have came back from work like an hour ago. So it's been a long day, but I'm excited to like uh, take part in this webinar. Excellent. So uh, it's really nice to have you here. And actually, let me just start off by asking you, you know, like what, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with our Defense Science and Technology Agency um, in Singapore? Yeah, sure. I can share like what my day-to-day -day is mostly like. So um, yeah, my role at uh, DSTA, so we now call it DSTA for short, and basically I'm a UX architect there. So there's this like differentiation between um, how the UX practitioners in DSTA, they kind of differentiate between UX architects and UX designers. So what the difference is, is that UX architects focus more on the usability of a product. So we tend to work more on like broader interaction design and the information architecture of a system coming up with like user flows, wireframes, and more mid-file prototypes. Whereas the UX designers in DSTA tend to focus more on the desirability of a system. So they work more on the visual design and coming up with more like high fidelity prototypes and design mockups. So yeah, uh, as a UX architect, um, my focus is on designing for usability. So my main contribution comes in terms of the interaction design and the information architecture of a system, which I tend to back up like using user research as well as design, design principles or like HCI principles. So my day-to-day -day goes like, it varies every day. I think that like, every day is quite different, but I guess it comprises mainly of a few activities. I think one activity is conducting some user research sessions. So this could range from anything it could be interviews, could be user testing, could be design studios or workshops. Mm. Um, if I'm not doing user research, another thing I might be doing is like having a work session. So sometimes I work alone, whereas most of the time I work in team in, in a team. And what we're doing is coming up with research artifacts. So things like the personas, our user journey maps, the information architecture. Or we also work with design artifacts, so coming up with wireframes, prototypes, and design mockups that might be used for like user testing later on. Um, yeah, apart from the work sessions, I also, uh, apart of that, like most of my day also is spent in team meetings. So I'm working on two different projects right now. So uh, yeah, during my projects, I have to sync up with two separate teams that comprise of other. UX designers, my project managers, software engineers, and analysts. And then finally, like if I'm not doing any of those things, we have quite a lot of like learning and courage in DSTA. So I could be doing a course on to upskill like my skill set or my domain knowledge. 
And we also have lots of like team sharings within the UX team where we learn from one another and also maybe provide feedback to each other on our own projects. So yeah, I think probably in a very long answer, I think that's what like my day tends to consist of these activities and no two days are the same. So I guess that's what makes it exciting. Well, thank you for sharing such a comprehensive answer, Jingxiu. So I was just wondering, you know, um, Defense Science Technology Agency sounds like a very, sounds like the CIA, you know, sounds very specific. So I was just wondering why, why does a, a, an organization that helps support our, our military in Singapore, um, why do they need UX designers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so DSTA, obviously what we're designing tend to be de defense systems. And I think like UX is especially important like for defense systems because of like a few reasons that make like defense systems a bit more different from I guess more commercial or like customer facing systems. So I think like one thing to think about is the context that like we are designing for. So in the defense systems, the users tend to be kind of interacting like under probably a highly stressful environment there might be like high cognitive load you might have a lot of information that you have to deal with very quickly so i think that's why we need ux designers because making this experience um as intuitive as user-friendly as possible is ideal because we can be able to support users in sense making in decision making under these highly stressful environments um i think another thing that why UX is important in defense system is also because of like the consequences of errors. So like in a defense system, some the errors can be a lot more costly rather than compared to a commercial system where it could just be a minor inconvenience. I think like, um, yeah, in the, in the defense system, like you can easily repair, recover from some errors just by clicking an undo button. So I think in that case, good usability is especially important as there's a like higher need to design for error prevention or error recovery. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And earlier you mentioned there's a difference between the role of a UX architect and a UX designer. Uh, and you mentioned yours is uh, that of a UX architect. I can imagine that uh, your responsibilities are, are great because, I mean, human lives uh, are, are in your hands uh, in some cases, right? Because as you're designing different um, systems for our defense and military over here. So um, moving on to the main topic of this evening, um, I wanted to just really chat with you on your journey, right? Um, you went to London to actually pursue a master's in human computer interaction, which is um, traditionally, if anyone wants to be a UX designer in any company, that's the master degree that they will go for. So uh, walk me through this process. Like, how did you come to make that decision about, you know, going for a degree instead of like going to a boot camp or instead of doing like self-study, you know, how did you came with that decision and why London? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think my journey into the in my into my masters is a little bit complicated and quite personal. So if I share a bit more about that, like basically I was doing my bachelor's in psychology already in London, and I think like in the past my goal was to go into a different field. I wanted to become an academic researcher in psychology, so I did in the when I was in my undergrad years, I did like quite a lot of internships in various like psychology research labs, including one in the US at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, yeah, so I was actually planning to pursue a master's in psychology and followed by a PhD and going to the academic route of becoming a professor in psychology. Uh, but I think in my third year, because of some like personal reasons, I realized that I really I chance upon the UX field in the HCI like discipline and I got really interested in it. And when I was choosing, because I was always going to do a master's anyway, I think, and I was choosing like between like uh, a psychology master's at Oxford University versus like this like HCI degree at UCL, I decided to like take a plunge into this career switch. And that's why I chanced into like a kind of master's in HCI. I think that's 
how I got into this master's is quite a unique and personal journey. But um, yeah, it's so it was like quite interesting. It was less for me a decision of choosing between a master's versus like a bootcamp or doing like self study. But I think I can definitely share like my thought process regarding that aspect of it as well, and like what are the difference yeah. to the masters as well as like a bootcamp and self study. So, so tell us a little bit about like you spending one one year uh, in your master's program uh, learning about human computer interaction. Like what 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 are like your takeaways from the program? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I can definitely share that. So. Maybe I'll share a little bit more about how the degree is structured so people can have a better idea. So the master's degree, like if you do it in the UK, it tends to only be one year compared to in the US and so like some other countries, sometimes it's two years. So it depends on where you're doing it. So the one I did was at UCL, which stands for University College London. And basically the master's degree was split into three terms. Uh, the first term, it was more of a foundational term where we did quite like foundational modules. So one was called interaction science, one was called interaction design. And I think we really learned the kind of theory in depth about what goes into the design of like uh, interactive uh, products. And then in the second term, we had the more like specialized and optional modules so we could explore our areas of interest. So I did modules like future interfaces, um, accessibility and assistive technologies, serious and persuasive games, and like user-centered data visualizations, which I found especially useful. And then in our final term, which is the third term, we do a dissertation. So this is a more like academically focused project, but there's a possibility of industry collaboration, which I managed to do as, which was really like useful experience. And yeah, so I think the master's is split into these three terms. And I think what was really valuable is I feel like I really got a very strong, like in-depth knowledge of um, human computer interaction principles. And I think that really helps in my work, like as a UX designer, because um, I feel like I'm able to think about all these principles as I'm coming out with the designs and being able to justify a lot of my design decisions based on the principles that I've learned like in this degree. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing. And um, may I ask, like usually those who actually teach you in terms of the, uh, in the HCI course we're talking about, like uh, what do the professors like specialize in? Yeah. Yeah, so the professors could specialize in a lot of different things. I think the, the interesting part about HCI is that just like UX, people come from many different backgrounds. So there could be some that come from like C computer science backgrounds, some that come from more like social sciences backgrounds, some that come from more design backgrounds and the things that they focus on could be very different. So some of the professors might really focus on um, some of the design methods, like some, I had a professor that was really involved in like sketching and how sketching can be used as a tool to um, in UX design or in HCI. Other professors that specialize more in data visualizations, um, some that specialize more in game design, and I think there's a whole broad range of like specializations that the professors have. Mm, yeah, thanks for sharing. And it sounds very cross-disciplinary. Is the student body also very cross-disciplinary? Um, uh, like where, where, did, where did they sort of like major in and, you know, um, where, where, where did they end up in later? Yeah, definitely. I think the student body is very cross-disciplinary. Uh, so for me, myself, I come from a more like social sciences background. And there are many that come from fields like psychology or anthropology as well, where I think our strengths lie more in the research methods of it or designing experimental studies. And I think that a lot of the people that come from this field end up going to more like user researcher roles. Um, apart from social sciences, that a lot of people came from design background as well. So they could have specialized in like industrial design or um, graphic design and wanted to transition into UX. And a lot of these people ended up more like uh, visual designers or like UI focused designers. 
and quite a few like come from computer science background as well. So they have quite good knowledge in development in coding. And I think a lot of these people end up either like in the UX designer role or more um, UX engineer role as they call it. So like they kind of, they can do like more higher fidelity prototypes with um yeah like uh there are code like there's code involved at a simpler level. So I think like these are the different diverse backgrounds that people come from. Yeah, thanks for sharing um, where they come from. So it sounds uh, quite research focused, but also there are some designers who are interested to transition into the few, um, very much like our programs as well. Uh, we usually have about half the participants uh, being from the design uh, industry, like whether it's architecture or whether it's graphic design or interior design. So I was um, also wondering, you know, like being in London, Right. Um, tell us a little bit more uh, about being in London and, and, and your, your internship in London and the practice of uh, UX in London. Uh, what can you share with us? Yeah, so I think like personally first, like I love being in London. I think like it's really interesting to be in a different country. Because like, for me, I grew up in Singapore like all my life. So we able to spend like a few years in London, like living a completely different life, meeting people from completely like different cultures, making friends there that like are very different from the friends that I've made in Singapore. I think that was such an exciting experience overall. Um, about, I guess my internship experience. So like I mentioned, I think the, the most relevant experience, internship experience that I had in London was related to my master's degree. So like I mentioned before in the third term of the degree, we do a research project and my research project was in collaboration with a data science company in London. And so apart from the academic contribution of my work, I did a lot of like UX design work as well. So uh, it's just some background about the project. Uh, this is a data science company that works with retailers and brands in the fast moving consumer goods industry, so the FMCG industry. So they work closely with like the equivalent of like NTUC Fair Price or Cool Storage in Singapore. And what they do is they use the insights from customer data to help their clients to boost their sales, build their customer loyalty, increase shopper satisfaction, etc. So the problem that was surfaced was that like employees in the company regularly use this data analysis tool to analyze the customer transaction data of like these tools and they wanted to, they commented that the tool was very unintuitive and difficult to use. So that's where I came into the project and I came in as a designer that aimed to improve the learnability as well as the usability of this data analysis tool. So I went through the whole UX process of like conducting the initial user research, defining the requirements, ideation, um, creating like an interactive prototype and evaluating the design. And then the, I think the outcome of it was that like, uh, I received like positive feedback from the users as well as like my supervisors on this project and my research artifacts and design recommendations that I came up with during the project was passed on to the development team for future implementation. Sounds like a great project and uh, congratulations yeah. to having your designs implemented and, and live out there. Yeah, uh, in the wild. Um, how long was that internship for you? Yeah, so it was about four months. No? Mm, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm curious about the practice, you know, now now that you are working in a Singapore um, setting, right? Yeah. With, with your team from, from Singapore and UX designers from Singapore, um, and you were in London um, working with your professors, working with um, like this company you mentioned about, like, how would you say that's that's sort of like a difference in terms of the practice or or maturity of things? Yeah, yeah, I think this is a tricky question, but one that is often like asked. Like a lot of people ask me about what the difference working in the UK versus working in Singapore is like, and yeah, I think generally, like, um, in general, I would think that the practice in the UK can be slightly higher than Singapore in terms of the UX maturity. But I also think it's quite difficult to 
generalize that because I think like having worked in multiple companies in both Singapore and the UK, I think it really depends a lot on the company itself and the mentors in the company itself because yeah, I think like there's a lot of different standing. So from what I hear, like generally sometimes what I hear is that the UX maturity in UK can be higher than that in Singapore, but I think it's hard to generalize because it depends really on the individual companies that you're working with and the people that, that are working there that are leading the teams. That um, is yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think one thing that I might say for me, I personally felt is different is the culture that I feel like in the UK there's a lot more focus on the people and the relationships and like cultivating that culture and relationships. Whereas I think in Singapore, people tend to be more efficient in that sense, but also more work focused. So I think from my experience, like in, when I'm working with people from the UK, there tends to be more like chit chat or like catch ups, like at the start and the end of meetings where you just like, talk for like 10, 15, or even 20 minutes like before a meeting to like understand like what our own like personal lives. Whereas I feel like sometimes in Singapore, I, when I go into a meeting, it's like, okay, straight, straight to the work, like what's happening, like what needs to be done and let's dive straight into it. So I think there's pros and cons. Obviously, I think the Singapore system can be a bit more efficient in that sense because you get things done more quickly. The meetings are not like dragged longer, but also, um, I think there's sometimes there's a need to like focus more on cultivating that relationship too. Yeah. But like I want to give a caveat as well that I think this is also quite difficult to generalize because I think each company has their own culture. So it really depends on the people you're working with and your own personality can affect that kind of relationship as well. Yeah, I can definitely empathize with that. I used to work for a British company <laughs> and, and we certainly had our moments of small talk and, and beer, early beer sessions. <laughs> uh, so I was just wondering, you know, like um, getting an internship in, in London, was that difficult or was it like sourced uh, from, by your school? You know, did you have to go out there and, and pitch yourself? Yeah, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so the internship that I mentioned already, it was like, uh, a collaboration with my my university so that was like uh, basically like I just selected the project I was interested in and I got paired to the company to work with them but apart from that experience I also actually did a UX internship with my university itself so UCL I helped them to redesign one of their websites that um they currently use is meant is used by staff and students to report like incidences of that happened in in the university. So it could be things like harassment, bullying, and so on. Um, yeah, so I think that one I had to source for myself because I saw an ad that came out and I applied for it. And I think that the uh, internship was a little bit more competitive to get because um it only had like three slots, but there were quite a big pool of participants that were trying to apply for it, not just from my master's course, but also from um, other, other degrees within the university. So that was like something that I had to kind of put myself out there to try and get it. So I think like that was an interesting process as well, as well as like applying for jobs in the future, etc. Like I think uh, being able to refine your portfolio, being able to yeah, refine your resume, being able to perform well in the interviews, I think like that was required to get some of the internship experience that yeah, I managed to get. Well, thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to try applying for jobs and roles in, in the UK before you came back to Singapore. Um, if not, I, I'll just cover about Singapore. Yeah, uh, so I didn't actually do that because I think like due to my own personal reasons and wanting to be back like in, at home with my family and friends that I kind of already decided that I was going to come back to Singapore to apply after the process. Yeah, so tell me a little bit more about that process. You know, you just graduated, fresh graduate, right? Um, yeah. uh, quite a number of people here in attendance are also like quite uh, fresh in terms of um, building their portfolio. So how, how did you go about the process of like uh, 
um, applying for a role in UX design um, in Singapore? Was it was it challenging? Uh, I heard it's very very competitive these days. Yeah, tell me. Uh, and it's pretty recent, right? So, uh, tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, it was pretty recent. So actually, the process was yeah, it was it was quite uh, packed because like I had the luxury and the privilege of like being able to apply like full time. So after my master's degree, I like traveled back to Singapore and as I was getting adjusted there, I had like some time to like really work full time on the job application process. So I think I was really lucky in that aspect because I know many people like have to do it part time. And I know it's a very like grueling process that is quite difficult. But yeah, so for my own process, like I took about two to three months to secure like uh, some job offers. So I think in the end, like I managed to get three competing offers, which in the end I chose from DSTA. Uh, so it involved like a long interview process. Like, I think uh, I applied like for maybe 50 or more different, different roles. And I think like about seven companies I went through like multiple rounds of interviews with before lending the three offers. So yeah, it was quite a long process. Um, yeah, that, that sounds like uh, quite a <laughs> quite a competitive <laughs> sort of like ratio. Um, we're talking about or you know seven companies um, uh, interviewing you, but you applied 49 to 49 companies or something. Yeah, uh, or 50 companies you said. So um, you know what, what would you do differently knowing what you know right now, right? Um, you know, would you have done anything differently in the interview process or the job application process to become a UX designer now? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think like the process can be split into like different stages. So maybe starting with like the applying stage, I think maybe one thing I did was I spent a lot of time trying to refine my portfolio and my resume before starting out and I think like as much as that part of the process is important um, uh, I think like you don't have to overdo it you don't have to spend like too much time on it and it helps to like get started in the application process and like tweak it iteratively like almost following the UX process or um, not spending too much time like making sure everything is perfect before you apply I think that's one thing that I might have done differently. Maybe another thing is that like to be a bit more selective with my applications because I think it's quite easy to see all the job ads out there and like apply for every single thing. But I think like nearing the end of my application, I realized that um, it might be helpful to kind of collate a list of like those that you think you are more interested in as well as you think you have higher likelihood of getting in and focusing your applications more on those rather than like like kind of like what they call like the spray and pray approach where you just like put in your application for as many as you can and hope like someone gets back to you. I think it's a mix of um, doing that approach while also doing more like networking sessions, which I did and turned out to be really helpful. Like I will reach out to people on LinkedIn to ask them for a chat. And I think during this chat, it's like I really wasn't asking them for a job or anything. It was really with the genuine interest to like learn about the UX field and about like what their role there is like and what they value in the UX designer, for instance. And then I think like based on that, like sometimes they would be nice enough to recommend you or refer you for a role like at a company and also reach out to your friends. I think like, especially those working in this field, I think like that was helpful for me as well in getting like um, links to some of the hiring managers in different companies. Yeah, so what I'm hearing, uh, because you just joined the STA in February, so uh, you, you probably did your job application around December, November uh, period. Um, so what I'm hearing is that uh, don't focus too much on getting your portfolio perfect, um, just get something out there. And then the next thing is actually to uh, not underestimate the power of social networks, uh, including yeah. your own network um, and talking to people. 
So I, I think that's that's really interesting that you you mentioned that uh, and something that we also encourage our our students to also spend time doing talking to uh, people in the industry, uh, even if it's just their seniors who already graduated and are UX designers. Um, I I was just wondering, you know, like in terms of the job application process, like in yeah. Singapore, right? Um, sometimes it's it's quite tedious. Sometimes it's quite intense. Sometimes they ask you to do all these design exercises. Um, do you have any tips, or do you have any like um, uh, uh, strategies to to help better, you know, um, go through this process of like working with multiple companies where to interview and yeah, 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 definitely. I think like. Different companies have different approach. So from my experience, some of them, you kind of do a portfolio presentation. Others, there could be a whiteboarding challenge and others, there could be a take-home design challenge. So um, I think my advice would be to be as prepared as possible. So for the portfolio presentation, what I did was really um, go through like how it's being presented like how I presented uh, the portfolio, how I was telling the story, how I emphasized like my how the process led to the outcomes. I think that's something that I really kept in mind. And for not not just like talk about your project, but really like tell a story with the project. I think that was helpful. Um, regarding the white body challenges, I think white body challenges can be quite stressful. So what helped me was to kind of prepare in my head before the whiteboarding challenge of like certain points that I would try to cover if I got stuck. Uh, and also in the whiteboarding challenge, I think it's helpful to really like think broadly before focusing on like one specific solution. I think like to consider like different alternatives before focusing on one solution that, that uh, I think is one of the mistakes I made in one of my whiteboarding session that like I when I focus too quickly on one solution and fail to consider like the context or the mm. different aspects of it. Uh, yeah, and then I think for take-home design challenges, to me that is the least stressful because you have your own time to think and work through it. But yeah, I think also don't stress too much about it and like um, as much as you can, like try to tell a story with your presentation. I think yeah. Yeah, that's my advice. I'm hearing storytelling being really important over here. So I'm sure um, that's something you, you had to do as well when you were studying in London and you had to present your work um, regularly to people. Um, I was also wondering when you, um, when we talk about whiteboard challenges, when we talk about take home exercises uh, and, and just for the benefit of our listeners, um, the whiteboard challenges are on the spot exercises, uh, problems that are assigned to you and that you have to solve right on the spot. Uh, you don't know what the question would be. It's it's right on that on that day itself. You're supposed to solve it. Uh, sometimes you have assistance from a colleague uh, over there, or sometimes you don't. Uh, you might have to solve it yourself. So that's um, that's the pressure uh, and time sensitivity of a whiteboard challenge. And take home exercises are usually two to three days are given to you to kind of like solve a problem and work through the problem uh, in the entire UX uh, design process. Um, so yeah, like um, if, if you're working through this um, and, and, and what if you have, I'm not sure if you actually encountered a situation where you had multiple uh, design take home exercises to work on. <laughs> Um, luckily, I didn't have multiple design exercises at once, but I think there was a little bit of overlap between one uh, whiteboarding exercise and my design challenge. So my design challenge like lasted a few days and then my whiteboarding exercise was in between one of those days. So I think for the whiteboarding challenge, I took out a day to really just like, think about like some possible questions they might ask. And then like immediately after that, went back to the design challenge. So yeah, that was uh, interesting and slightly stressful week. But yeah, I think I, like I said, I had the privilege of like doing it full time, which really helped a lot. 
Like if you have to like juggle a part time job while doing this application process, it might not be as easy. Yeah. Uh, I think doing it remotely can also be a challenge. Like because most of my application process was remote, and especially the whiteboard challenges, I think it was quite difficult. Like doing everything remotely because, like we did it on Miro or Miro, whichever you call it, and like I think having to like take out a post it note and like put it where you want and type it, like it takes a much longer time than if you're actually physically like putting it on a whiteboard. So I think that doing it, this process remotely was a bit of a challenge as well. I, well, I, d- I definitely agree um, on <laughs> doing your interviews remotely being a challenge. Um, I, I guess this is kind of the norm right now, right? You're expected um, as a UX designer to know how to do your job um, physically, but also remotely. Um, as well so uh, yeah like do you have any advice or tips um, on going through this interview process um, remotely yeah I mean I think there are pros and cons to remote interviews or remote interviewing processes so I mean the pros is that like I think as an introvert myself I feel like it's a lot less stimulating like doing it in front of a screen than like going to the office because I think like there's a lot of like unexpected things that can happen if you are actually traveling there. So I think that's one of the perks, as well as being able to like prepare in advance and even like put some notes on the site while you're talking to the interviewer. I think that is something that does help the process. Um, but I think you lose a little bit of the body language and being able to sense like whether the people you are working with or like being interviewed by are uh, um, kind of agreeing with your points or not. So I think that is a tough part of it. And like I said, if you have to do some sort of challenge on the spot, um, having to do it remotely, like juggle with your tools while like just, just, you have a video like up and your computer is like lagging all the time. I think that is one of the struggles. Um, yeah, so I think like, I don't have specific tips on doing it remotely. Um, just in general, like prepare as much as you can. I think that would be my main advice. And like, yeah, as so when doing it remotely, you might be able to like have like some notes like available while you're doing it. I, I certainly hear that, and I think that's a, actually really good advice to kind of put notes beside your <laughs> monitor. And just to talk about the talking points you want to talk about, just in case you, you forget. Uh, so, yeah. um, but also the fact that I think when you, um, like for example, today in, in this webinar, um, you're in this interview, your camera is framed pretty nicely and the lighting is all, all like very equal as well. Mm-hmm. So that, that also shows like, hey, actually um, the internet connection is stable, the image is clear, the audio is clear. So everything is clear and um, that, that also helps with the remote um, interview itself. So um, good to hear that. I got a question from one of your juniors um, who's going to UCL uh, this fall uh, and uh, she's from Japan. Uh, and uh, Renako mentioned that uh, she's hoping to land a job in UX research in the US uh, because of the limited positions of uh, UX research roles in Japan. Uh, so she was wondering if there were any students from your program uh, who, who managed to land jobs um, internationally, right? I guess, including London, including in the US. Um, yeah, did, did any of your classmates end up uh, going there uh, as a foreigner? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So like UCL is quite a, has quite an international um, student body. So there were lots of people from different like cultures that ended up at the master's program. So people from Japan as well. Um, there are also people from around Europe, people from the States. So a lot of people like went to do the program there. I think quite a few of them managed to land a job in London. Uh, so most of the people that apply to UCL try to want to try and get a job in London because I think like being able to be in the country already really helps in terms of the interviewing process with recruiters or with hiring managers and like showing that you have stayed there for a while and have the ability to stay there um, for 
a few months or up to a year after your finish your masters that really helps you like ease into the job and like look for jobs in the meantime so there are definitely a lot of people that from international uh, bodies that went to London and managed to stay there after their after the master's degree um I think most a lot of people also managed to like get jobs elsewhere but from my knowledge most of them uh, get it back in their home country so I think something that you might have to think about is uh, the, the visa side of it, whether the company you're applying for can sponsor your visa and whether they need like the interview to be conducted in person or because I think all these are the factors that determine like how easy it is to apply to like international, international company. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm sure she appreciates the answer and she said it's very helpful. Um, I have another question um, from uh, one of my students and uh, Gregory asked, you know, uh, for those who don't have the opportunity to go overseas, uh, what can someone who studied in Singapore um, as a UXer do to be like more globally competent or reach like a global standard? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think like I mentioned that it's very valuable to like work with people from different countries. So if besides being there physically, I think like LinkedIn is probably a very helpful tool or any like social networking tool. I think nowadays it can be quite easy to reach out to people regardless of where they are and having that conversation with them and trying to make connections. Uh, I think that is one route that could be very helpful. Another thing is perhaps like attending virtual like talks or um, conferences, et cetera, that have an international audience. And I think like through those, through those processes, it might be possible to be able to network with other UX practitioners that come from all the different countries. And yeah, I think like being able to share your perspectives, maybe like share like what's the difference like between your work and theirs and share like your learnings as well. I think that can be really helpful. Mm. So it sounds like the general advice is to talk to um, other practitioners, especially practitioners that are not from Singapore. Um, and also being able to do some work that may, may not come from Singapore as well, mm -hmm. uh, if possible. So that's, that's helpful. Um, do, you, do, do you think like, is there like any literature or is there, um, I guess like books or anything like that? Uh, or, or, or events that you would um, uh, recommend uh, to kind of like get people more up to speed in terms of the global UX standard? Um, I think not at the top of my head, but for me, I tend to try and like watch like talks or if I see online webinars that are held in different countries I think a lot of them tend to be from the states or the UK but also like uh, more diverse um, events in that sense I would try to yeah like uh, attend them if I can because I think if you're looking for getting the you expect this from a global audience it helps to attend like talks or webinars given by people from other countries that specialize and work there I think that really would help in terms of that. But I think uh, regardless of that, just like read widely, there are a lot of books uh, on UX that are written by many different authors and they tend to give like a quite broad perspective. And most of them are written like outside of Singapore. So I think like by just reading widely and attending, like listening to other people talk about UX, I think that would give you as much of a diverse like um, understanding of the field as possible and I think like that's although like a lot of people tend to emphasize like the global audience and how UX is done in different countries like I said um, within the like, different organizations as well UX can be done very differently uh, so it just pays to be curious to understand like how UX is done differently at different places and it doesn't have to be like a uh, Singapore versus another country kind of mindset, I think. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, 
someone's asking about the book called The Culture Map by Aaron Mayer. I'm not sure if you've read that one or have any thoughts on that. No, sorry, haven't uh, heard about yeah, that. Fine. And I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what did your university assign you as uh, <laughs> essential reading <laughs> for your... Yeah, so I think uh, essential readings are not so much uh, more like like uh, traditional books, but it tends to be more like textbook focus. So I think one of our readings was this like textbook called Interaction Design that was written by one of our professors in collaboration with other professors. Mm -hmm. It's just a very thick textbook that is quite comprehensive on HCI principles. Um, but apart from that, we do a lot of readings on scientific papers. And I think that's quite interesting because like the scientific papers um, really like have like they're either a review paper of several studies or a specific study that they went through to prove or uh, to show evidence for a certain theory. So I think things like one is like Fitz Law. I think that one is like quite commonly known in the UX world. So um basically the gist of it is that uh it's a law that describes how targets that are bigger and closer to you, you can move your cursor and click it more quickly. I think that's like the most like layman explanation of this law. No? And I think they expand on the different variations on that, criticize like, is it really valuable? Because like, it's not just a 2D dimension, but, but it's, they do it in a one, di one dimension, but actually when you move your cursor, it's like in two dimensions. And how do you calculate the distance based on that and, and like, the width versus the height and so on. So I think like we really go quite in depth into um, all these principles of HCI. Another one that I found quite interesting is like it's called a uh, post-competition errors. So they found that a lot of people tend to make errors more frequently in situations where the, they've already completed their tasks. So the most famous example is like an ATM machine. There's a reason why ATM machines nowadays are designed such that um, you have to take your card out first before you take your money. Because in the past, when people take their money, they tend to forget their card and leave because they have already completed their task of drawing the money. And they make this what we call a post completion error where they already completed their task and they forget to complete the final step. I think an equivalent of this is like, and you photocopy something and people tend to leave the original in the photocopying machine because um, they've really got their photocopy but they forgot to take the original back. So I think this is like an example of what we learned in HCI as well, and which I thought was quite interesting. I, I love the fact that you're recommending peer, are, are these papers peer reviewed already or they're just? Yeah. yeah so I, I love the fact that you're recommending peer reviewed papers that are written by maybe master degree students like yourself or even uh, PhD students who are in the, researching in a few of HCI. Yeah, I mean, I think these papers tend to be written by professors that have been like in this field for a long time. So yeah, cool. quite, yeah. I mean, obviously that this like PhD students as well as master students like do their own research projects as well, but yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, and I, I know that uh, Carnegie Mellon University in, in the US, um, uh, one of the most renowned uh, HCI programs, uh, they publish a lot of papers as well. So it's really, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. And I think this is maybe should be something I should be asking more of my students to do. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. And uh, we have a question which is kind of related. Um, Raylene from the audience asks, like, um, do you feel that behavioral science is applicable to UX work, um, knowing that you majored in psychology? So I, I guess you have some perspectives about behavioral science? Yeah, I think it definitely helps. Like coming from uh, psychology and a behavior science background, I think a lot of the principles we learn in psychology is also very relevant to UX. Could be like cognitive psychology principles, like how people perceive things. So I think one very more well-known thing is like the just thought loss of perception. And I think that is also very related to psychology. Things like color pops up a lot more easily to our attention compared to um, things like shapes or uh, and like motion is also something that really captures our attention really well. I think like this is all related to the behavior science part of it. I think also 
yeah, like understanding humans a bit more is, yeah, basically I think it's very valuable in user-centered design, obviously we're like human-centered design. And I think apart from the kind of theory or the, what we learn in psychology, I think the skills that we practice in psychology or behavior science is very important too, because in behavior science, there's a lot of um, experimental design and data analysis. And I think that is very relevant to the user research that we do in UX design on how to design a fair experiment, the non-biased experiment, and also how to interpret the qualitative and quantitative data that we get out of it. I think that is very relevant from the field of behavioral, mm. behavioral science as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, like how many, I, I, it could be a ballpark figure, but like how many papers have you, have you read while you're preparing for the role to be like a UX designer? I just want to like get a, get a sense, you know, like including stuff that you have to read when you were in school. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have read a lot of papers because like, I think in, in a master's degree or even an undergraduate degree, each kind of work you submit, you always cite examples of, or you cite like the evidence of what has been proven. So, I mean, for a typical like submission, I would cite probably like 40 different papers. So that, that, that means like... It's a lot of... That's a yeah, lot. Like for each module that I've done, so I've done it. If just for my master's, besides my undergrad experience, it would have been six modules. So I've read at least like 200-ish papers, I think. So, it, I mean, reading papers is also a skill in itself. Like, I don't think I've read like from the top to the end of every single paper. There's an abstract that you can read. And if something that is very interesting and you really want to understand the methodology of how they found this specific like evidence, you can read more of the method and the results. But sometimes it's just helpful to just read the abstract to get the gist of it and go into the sections that you're interested in. So you don't have to read like the whole paper for every single scientific paper. Yeah, that's awesome. But the fact that you remember some of them, I think that really helps to um, differentiate you a little bit um, in the pool of candidates out there, right? Because yeah. uh, instead of you quoting a book, which most people do, um, you're quoting a paper right now. <laughs> And you're saying, hey, based on this practice I read from the university of this and that, um, like that's this thing, right? And they've done this, this research study. Uh, I was wondering if, if that actually made an impression on, on uh, any interviewers that you talked to uh, while you were uh, going through the interview process. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so have, I think that the master's degree was really helpful in giving me this like deep foundation. And obviously, I might not be able to name like the authors and the idea of a paper like off the top of my brain, but I think having this like broad concepts that keep like coming up as I'm practicing UX really helps. Like when I'm, I'm designing something, I would remember like something I've learned before and that can help to inform the design of what I'm doing. So during the interviewing process, I think like especially some of my whiteboarding challenges or design, uh, take home design challenges, I would justify some of my design decisions based on these scientific papers that I think was quite helpful like in terms of showing like a deeper understanding of the goal that I'm not just this because in a design in a design challenge you don't have much time to get substantial user research so a lot of my justifications had to come from common design principles so I think like having this um, background and knowledge really helped. Yeah, this is really great. I mean, the fact that you said you went through seven interviews, but you got three job offers, that means like it's almost like a 40% kind of like success rate, right? So that means you probably knocked, your, <laughs> knocked the socks off of your interviewers and they were quite impressed uh, that uh, almost half of them decided to give you a job offer uh, and in, this, in this case. Um, yeah, this is, this is really helpful. And I think... Um, I was just wondering, uh, there are people who are now going through the process that you went through about uh, four, uh, or rather say like four to six months ago, right? Um, and I was wondering if you have any advice, any tips uh, for them, um, especially it can be a very discouraging process, uh, rejection. So I was just wondering, do you have any tips and advice for the people who are listening here? 
Yeah, definitely. I think one advice that I would give is to be confident in your own unique strengths and background. Um, I think like imposter syndrome is very strong. Like whether you're an applicant or even when like you start working, I think you always feel that like, you always see like people with strengths all around you and they come from like backgrounds which you can barely understand. But I think like it's helpful to remember that your own background is unique as well and you have a lot of skill sets that are yeah that a lot of other people do not have. And I think my advice would be to remember that and stay confident as well as like try and leverage like your own skills to like throughout your job seeking process as well as in the future when you land your role as a UX designer. And apart from that, I think also always just like be, be like try to learn something new every day. I think like this learning mindset is really helpful and pick up at any opportunities you can. I think like what helped me to learn my like UX though also like came a lot from my experience in my internships. And I think like to take an initiative to find those opportunities to do the internships and to accept like offers that come your way. I think making the most of what you all the opportunities around you and always be trying to learn and upskill yourself. I think that's very fair. Yeah, it sounds like practice is important. Um, but also staying curious and the fact that you're always learning and you're always growing in that process. Um, and thank you for, for being so humble about it and, and sharing, uh, you know, like that, that you have imposter syndrome. I'm sure many people um, also struggle with that. Um, and and I, I think that uh, that's something people tend to feel when they are transitioning into a new industry, especially when you're surrounded by people who are who seem more experienced or seem more capable or more talented than, than they are. And I think we all feel it at some level. And uh, you mentioned about uh, being confident. Um, how, how, just as a final question, you know, like how, how did you find what you're good at? How do you sort of like know what you're strong at and, you know, sticking to what you're mentioning, what you're strong at and what you're good at? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a difficult question to answer. I think it comes with like, a lot of introspection and reflection. So I think like I try to practice that quite a lot, like even yeah, like, throughout my life and even after I got a job in the field, like I think every few weeks or every month or even every day, I try to like reflect and think about like, was there something new I learned? Um, did anything go well and what didn't go well? How can I improve? I think like for me, always having this mindset of understanding yourself and reflecting on yourself, like you can tell like what works for you and what doesn't, um, what you're good at and what you can improve. And having the initiative and the drive to work on those things as a part of yourself, I think that really helps you. So even if you're not the best, like, UX designer or person now, like you're old, you know you're always improving and getting better. And I think like having that growth mindset is the most crucial in yeah, becoming both a better like, practitioner as well as a better person. Mm. So going back to the main topic at hand uh, this evening, which is the value of uh, internships and the value of a degree, uh, <laughs> would you would you recommend people to invest in in a sort of like a degree, like a like master degree, H HCI master degree, uh, with the time and the the money that's involved in it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it depends on each person's individual circumstances. Like I mentioned before, that I think I'm quite privileged in the sense that I had the financial support as well as the time to be able to pursue this masters. And I think if you have those conditions, I would definitely recommend it. I think. It is firstly very interesting. I think that I really enjoyed like learning about HCI and also having the experience of studying overseas and experiencing a new culture that's really very valuable. I think there's also a lot of perks in it. It gives you a very strong foundation in the UX practice. And it also um, kind of gives you a little bit of credibility when you're applying. So I think like, especially if you come from a non-UX background, uh, I think it really helps in that sense. So it really depends on your own circumstances. I think I don't, I think maybe one of the, 
uh, I guess one of the flaws of the degree, not really flaws, but I think something that people don't really know about is that you don't really learn a lot of the practical skills there. So I think in my, you don't really learn about how to use a design tool like Figma or Adobe XD, for example. So, or even like it focuses a lot more on the theoretical aspect of it. So I think if you want to become like a good like UX practitioner, it still requires a lot of drive and a lot of initiative on your own part. Um, it doesn't just come with the degree. But with all that being said, I think like it's definitely an experience that I don't regret and I would recommend it for people that um, have the right circumstances and the right support needed to pursue it. But if not, I think there are also many other ways to get into the UX field and like I think everyone has their own path and will be able to get there in their own way. Mm, I definitely agree with that. And uh, so you talk about practitioner and, and practicing experience. So um, I guess internships kind of make up for that. Um, so how uh, would you recommend people spend time um, doing internships, even sometimes if the internships pay very low or they are kind of like unpaid? Um, yeah, would you recommend that they get relevant experience being a UX designer in, in such internships? Yeah, I mean, I think this one is a little bit more straightforward. Like, I would definitely recommend it. Like I said, if you have, you're under the circumstance that like me, you're not yet having to support a family, for example, and you can afford like not to be paid very much while doing an internship, I think like it definitely, definitely really helps in the transition because being able to show that you have like practical experience in doing UX is very different from like someone who only has the knowledge and like went through a boot camp or went through like a uh, like a uh, degree even, like if you never practice it, like I think you don't really learn as much. So I really, really like emphasize that take up a, as much opportunity as you can. Like I think even if the internship doesn't pay very well, I see it more like an investment in my own future. Like this can get you to a full-time job in the future that can pay a lot better sometimes. So I think definitely recommend like pursuing the internships if you can and taking up any opportunity you can. I, I love that attitude and um, thank you for your contributions this evening to um, your fellow juniors and as well as people who are um, maybe just uh, like you, right? And who are about to transition into the field of UX design. Uh, you shared some really wonderful insights uh, into the process on how to prepare for it, um, as well as like how to differentiate yourselves and uh, steer away from imposter syndrome this evening. Uh, so thank you. Jingxiu Cheng, once again, um, UX architect at DSTA, uh, our Defense Science Technology Agency in uh, Singapore. So uh, with that, uh, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, please uh, feel free to kind of like drop um, a note and a message or a thank you note uh, as you're exiting the conversation. Um, and uh, we will be staying around for a couple of minutes. Uh, for those of you in the chat, uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking like some uh, off the record kind of questions you want to ask things you um and i will see you next month uh all of you will will have a different webinar guests and uh we, we do this on a monthly basis it's really for the community uh, we don't charge you a single cent uh, we're really trying to share with um the communities in in ux uh, whether it's asia pacific and beyond like how practitioners in apac are practicing ux design and if you'd like to check out some of our past episodes, we do have our recordings on YouTube, uh, Curious Core, as well as on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So if you love to hear more of my voice, uh, you're very welcome to check them out. So have a very good evening and I'll stop the live recording now. <laughs>